So as my title alludes to, um, we study terrestrial planet formation, but in particular we're interested in forming planets like the Earth and studying planet formation in the solar system to see how uh, unique we really are in the cosmos and how likely planets like Earth are to form elsewhere. Um, so since this is a mixed audience, not everyone is, has a background in planet formation, we're going to give a quick down and dirty uh, explanation of the general process of planet formation as we understand it. So obviously a star forms by uh, a big cloud of gas and dust collapsing. So you have some sort of protoplanetary disk that's surrounding a young star. Um, and we're going to call this state, this star just formed, time zero. Um, geologists call this CAI, calcium aluminum rich inclusion. So that's basically the oldest things we can date, the first solids that formed. Um, so that's going to be time equals zero. So eventually, through some process that's not really well understood, you're going to start to form small asteroid-like objects out of this, this dust. Um, so what explains that is not really understood. It's potentially gas drag of these small little uh, dust millimeter sized pebble like objects. But that has to happen in thousand to million year time scales. You're going to form these small planetesimals. And then once you have these planetesimals, which are these asteroid like objects, through it, gravitational focusing and again aerodynamic gra drag in the gas disk, you're going to get some of the planetesimals to grow larger, slightly larger than the other ones, and then they can focus more planetesimals towards themselves, and you're going to get runaway growth throughout the disks, and you're basically going to form some sort of a bimodal uh, distribution of now larger by a factor of 10 or more planet embryos embedded in this sea of asteroid-like planetesimals. And then as the gas goes away through a series of giant impacts, these embryos and planetesimals are going to clear out the disk and hopefully form a nice series of planets like the inner solar system. Um, so unfortunately, uh, we really have to uh, take our ideas of planet formation in context um, because clearly it cannot be that simple. Because not only are the planets in the solar system extremely diverse, we have the outer uh, giant gaseous planets like Jupiter and Saturn, which are hundreds of times the mass of the Earth. Then we have these ice giants, which are made more of ice and are tens of times the mass of the Earth. Then we have small little planets like Mercury and Mars. Um, and then we have the Earth, this beautiful oasis that we live on. And then we compare that out to different series of exoplanets that we find. And we find um, hot Jupiters. So planets that are much larger than Jupiter, much closer to Mercury. And then we have series of close-in Earth-sized planets like the Trappist system. So the answer is it's complicated. So the kind of entering argument that we're going to start with for all of our simulations that you have to understand is that through whatever means, the giant planets have to form first. It's not really understood fully how, whether we have some ideas. Um, but we do know that because the gas uh, giant planets um, contain these large gaseous envelopes, they have to form while gas is still available in the disk. Now gas dissipates on time scales of millions of years, so a couple millions of years, whereas uh, the rocks we've dated from like the Earth and the Moon and meteors that we think came from Mars, we think those objects took tens to hundreds of millions of years to form. So you have a whole order of magnitude difference in the formation time scales of the gas planets because they had to have formed that fast while there was gas around for them to eat up and the terrestrial planets. So you have a picture like this where the gas planets, the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are fully formed on something similar to their current orbits um, exterior to this disk of leftover material that's going to form the terrestrial planets. So in reality, this disk of material is going to be a whole bunch of different millimeter to meter to kilometer to asteroid to protoplanet sized objects. So a bunch of objects of, of different sizes and different um, potentially different compositions that are going to hopefully combine to form the terrestrial planets. So we study this process numerically. Um, the way we do that, we obviously can't uh, model the terrestrial disk, which is made in reality of millions and millions of objects. 
So we have to break it down into that bimodal mass distribution we talked about earlier. So we use tens to hundreds of usually equal massed planet embryos embedded in a sea of uh, planetesimals. So, and we use thousands of planetesimals, and we assume that they don't interact gravitationally with one another. Um, they only interact gravitationally with the planet embryos. And you can show that if you do um, let them interact gravitationally, or if you use more or less, uh, you get more or less the same answer. What really determines um, the final system that you're going to get is that embryo distribution you choose. We use about a five-day time step, so that's the innermost objects, the objects around Mercury, they get 20 time steps per orbit. Um, and we run about 200 million year long simulations, and that's kind of consistent with those time scales for Earth's formation in the hundreds of millions of years. Um, we use these n-body integrators that are able to speed up these integrations by basically you do a half time step where you just assume everything goes perfectly on its little Keplerian arc, and then you apply all the perturbative kicks the second time step, the second half time step. So we take that original picture and we simplify it into this. We have this little bimodal um, distribution of planetesimals and embryos, where the planetesimals are about uh, an order of magnitude less in mass than the planet embryos. And ideally, we're going to get this out. So you're going to get a planet about 5% the mass of Earth that is extremely depleted in volatiles where Mercury is, we want to get a planet about the mass of Earth that didn't get delivered a bunch of water, ices from the outer solar system about where Venus is. We want to get an Earth mass planet where Earth is that somehow through some process got water so we can have life on Earth. And then we want a little Mars-sized planet, which is about 10% the mass of the Earth out where Mars is. And then hopefully we have a little bit of leftover material out where the asteroid belt is. So here's an example of a simulation which is uh, performed using what we call the standard initial conditions. So this basically just assumes a uniform distribution of a material. You get kind of the mass of mater uh, material that you're going to use from the minimum mass solar nebula. And we can also look at protostellar disks and how the mass distribution profile goes. We just lay down these planetesimals and embryos and see what happens. Obviously, you have Jupiter and the other outer planets in this simulation. You can't see the rest of them. But what happens is these simulations are extremely successful at producing the four inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, where they should be. However, as you can see here, in this simulation, the largest planet formed was Mars. It's bigger than Earth and Venus. And you have this little larger than Mars mass planet, about half Earth mass planet, out in the asteroid belt. So these are the biggest problems with these standard initial condition simulations. You produce too large a Mars. Um, you don't deplete the asteroid belt enough. The actual asteroid belt, if you add up all the asteroids in this whole region, which is from 2 to 4 AU, you have um, a, just a few percent the mass of the moon. And the moon is just a percent the mass of the Earth. So there's not a lot of stuff out there. And also the orbital inclinations and eccentricities of the terrestrial planets formed in these simulations are almost always too high. So we came up with this new model over the last year, and we've been running follow-on simulations on blue waters, which I'm going to talk about, about this model. And basically, we're arguing um, that the giant planets must have underwent some sort of a orbital instability while the terrestrial planets were still forming. This, If you're familiar with the field, this is known as the Nice model. Um, and we're arguing that that can explain a lot of um, these, these issues that these standard initial conditions are having. So when we trigger this instability in the outer solar system at the right time, there's a lot of evidence for this instability. Um, it's been used to explain distribution in the asteroid belt, orbit distribution in the Kuiper belt, irregular satellites throughout the solar system. If we trigger it at the right time, you heavily perturb the material, particularly in the asteroid belt and in the Mars region. So what happens is when the instability ensues, if you trigger it at the right time, you have four or five Mars-ish within a few order of magnitude of Mars mass objects out there that would eventually combine into a Mars, into a, a Earth mass planet. 
what happens in our successful runs is you get rid of all but one of these. Most of our runs, you, you either wipe all of them out or you're left with two or one. So the really successful ones, only one of them survives, and it, it goes untouched from the time of the instability to the end of the simulation. Now, this is good because um, it's thought that Mars formed an order of magnitude quicker than Earth formed. So it's some event had to stunt Mars's growth, and we're arguing that it's this instability. So how do we do with forming small Marses? We do fairly well. So the red line here, this is a cumulative distribution plot. The red line is our control simulation. So as you can see, over 80% of them form Mars analogs several times larger in mass um, than actual Mars, very much closer to Earth's, Earth's mass. The vertical line here is the actual mass of Mars. So you can see about half of our Marses are less mass than actual Mars, and half of them are larger. So we're very successful at forming a, a low-mass Mars. So how do we do um, with forming terrestrial planets on dynamically colder orbits, lower orbital eccentricities and inclinations? We didn't do too well. The original simulations were just as bad as everyone else was doing. So we thought, well, maybe one of the issues is that um, our original simulations and the majority of the work that's done in the field doesn't take collisional fragmentation into account. So the majority of simulations of terrestrial plant formation, when two things collide, they just are assumed to stick together. It's obviously not physical. So we used the new code on Blue Waters this past year to redo all of this, um, all of our simulations, using a code that includes the different fragmentation regimes. So things can hit and run with one another. Things can graze and then take a few more uh, orbits and eventually merge. Things can have big fragmenting collisions that spit a bunch of new fragments out. And what we found is that the eccentricities of the forming Earth and Venus analogs stay consistently lower throughout the simulation. The reason for that is you have this sea of smaller objects for much longer in the simulation. So you get a lot of dynamical friction from these smaller fragments and these smaller little planetesimals that hit and run and don't really reaccrete. Um, and that is able to keep the orbital eccentricities of Earth and Venus lower. So what about the asteroid belt problem? Um, again, we used Blue Waters this last year to redo a bunch of these simulations using a GPU code that can perform calculations in parallel and greatly speed up simulations. So our original simulations, um, at the end of simulation, you just have five or 10 objects out in the asteroid belt. If you saw in that video, we just have a few asteroids out there. And those asteroids are actually like 20 times the mass of the present asteroid belt, so it's not very realistic. Um, so we redid these simulations using 3,000 series size asteroids. Series is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, so we're actually probing this process down to realistic mass scales in the asteroid belt. And what we found is that we actually got a lot of depletion, which was good, and we had a good broad match to the orbital structure in the asteroid belt. So one problem with previous models, uh, which you have two previous models here on the, the right of the picture and the actual asteroid belt on the upper left, this is an inclination semi-major axis plot. That dashed line is a new six secular resonance with Saturn. And every previous model over excites that region. You end up with way too many objects above that new six secular resonance. Whereas in the actual asteroid belt, it's only a few percent the mass of the asteroid belt is above that resonance. We do a much better job of uh, matching that. And there's reasons for that. If you want to talk to me afterwards, we can go into that. Um, so with my final few minutes, uh, I alluded to the fact that you know, we, we really have to make some simplifications when we do these models of terrestrial plant formation. Um, and one of those simplifications, not even a simplification, it's just that we don't know the initial conditions too well. And that could be why the solar system looks so different than other exoplanet systems. So these initial conditions we're using may just be the fault of why we're making these larger than Mars size Mars and we're leaving these large asteroid belts behind because, as I said, we start with this sea of embryos. And those embryos are, that we've used in these actual simulations, they're about a quarter of the mass of Mars. So to make a Mars analog, you really need like three collisions. Um, so the mass resolution there is, is not that great. And um, in the asteroid belt, 
one of those embryos is 160 times the mass of the entire present asteroid belt. And you have tens of these throughout the asteroid belt region. So the question is, in the, the real solar system, what emerged from the gas, the gas disk, the forming terrestrial disk, did you really have these large moon to Mars size embryos um, out by the asteroid belt? So we're testing this problem with GPUs as well. Um, so where these standard initial conditions came from, it's kind of a series of papers uh, in the 90s where they took basically narrow annuli, um, so like a, a 0 0.01, 0 0.02 AU narrow annuli of a whole bunch of little uh, particles. They didn't do really realistic collisions, um, and they, they didn't test different semi-major axes throughout the disk. They, they use analytical conversions to convert out. And uh, basically, that, that's kind of been the state of what we're basing our models off for, for the next uh, 20 years. So we're redoing all this stuff with our GPU code. And we're, we started with a series of narrow annuli of 5,000 fully self-interacting particles at all different semi-major axes. And we included the gas effects from the gas disk. And we let these things go for a little bit. And as we got down in particle number, we widened them and widened them. So eventually, these are still running. We're going to combine them all and hopefully have built up a, a disk of an embryo distribution um, out of what is millions of initial small particles. And basically, this is some initial results from this. The different colors are different locations throughout the disk. But obviously, these things uh, run away grow exponentially faster in the inner parts of the disk. Um, and we're, we're farther past this now. But basically, what this is showing is that um, you don't make moon to Mars size embryos out in the asteroid belt. So this, this initial conditions we've been using are probably uh, completely incorrect. So because of the effect of the instability has in our model is that these, these small things get excited and often get lost. If there, there is more small stuff and fewer embryos and the embryos themselves are smaller out in the asteroid belt, we would get much more depletion. So that's where things are going. Um, of course, I'd like to thank Blue Waters. Uh, everyone's got kind of a wide Blue Waters slide. And for us, it was the GPUs. Um, we were able to run tons of little single node GPU jobs that start up immediately. Uh, sorry if I'm bogging everyone else's queue down. And there was a large computational demand for this project, so that helped out a lot. Um, obviously, the money from the fellowship was sweet. And special thanks to Roland, who's my, uh, my Blue Waters point of contact and was very helpful. So in conclusion, we argue that this orbital instability between the giant planets um, is a natural explanation for Mars's small mass. If our models take into account collisional fragmentation, we can explain the, the dynamically cold orbits in the inner solar system. And this problem with Mars and the asteroid belt might have to do with the fact that our initial conditions we're using are, are somewhat fictitious.